Yellow Iris by Agatha Christie Performed by Hugh Fraser Yellow Iris Hercule Poirot stretched out his feet towards the electric radiator set in the wall. Its neat arrangement of red-hot bars pleased his orderly mind. A coal fire, he mused to himself, was always shapeless and haphazard. Never did it achieve the symmetry. The telephone bell rang. Poirot rose, glancing at his watch as he did so. The time was close on half-past eleven. He wondered who was ringing him up at this hour. It might, of course, be a wrong number. And it might, he murmured to himself with a whimsical smile, be a millionaire newspaper proprietor, found dead in the library of his country house with a spotted orchid clasped in his left hand and a page torn from a cookbook pinned to his breast. Smiling at the pleasing conceit, he lifted the receiver. Immediately a voice spoke, a soft, husky woman's voice, with a kind of desperate urgency about it. Is that Monsieur Hercule Poirot? Is that Monsieur Hercule Poirot? Hercule Poirot speaks. Monsieur Poirot, can you come at once? At once? I'm in danger, in great danger. I know it, Poirot said sharply. Who are you? Where are you speaking from? The voice came more faintly, but with an even greater urgency. At once. It's life or death. The Jardin des Signes. At once. Table with yellow irises. There was a pause a queer kind of gasp. The line went dead. Hercule Poirot hung up. His face was puzzled. He murmured between his teeth, There is something here very curious. In the doorway of the Jardin des Signes, fat Luigi hurried forward. Buona sera, Monsieur Poirot. You desire a table, yes? No, no, my good Luigi. I seek here for some friends. I will look round. Perhaps they are not here yet. Ah, let me see. That table there in the corner with the yellow irises. A little question, by the way, if it is not indiscreet. On all the other tables there are tulips, pink tulips. Why on that one table do you have yellow irises? Luigi shrugged his expressive shoulders. A command, monsieur. A special order. Without doubt the favorite flowers of one of the ladies. That table is the table of Mr. Barton Russell, an American immensely rich. Aha! One must study the whims of the ladies, must one not, Luigi? Monsieur has said it, said Luigi. I see at that table an acquaintance of mine. I must go and speak to him. Poirot skirted his way delicately round the dancing floor on which couples were revolving. The table in question was set for six, but it had at the moment only one occupant, a young man who was thoughtfully, and it seemed pessimistically, drinking champagne. He was not at all the person that Poirot had expected to see. It seemed impossible to associate the idea of danger or melodrama with any party of which Tony Chapel was a member. Poirot paused delicately by the table. Ah, it is, is it not my friend Anthony Chapel? By all that's wonderful! Poirot, the police hound, cried the young man. Not Anthony, my dear fellow. Tony to friends. He drew out a chair. Come, sit with me. Let us discourse on crime. Let us go further and drink to crime. He poured champagne into an empty glass. But what are you doing in this haunt of song and dance and merriment, my dear Poirot? We have no bodies here. Positively not a single body to offer you. Poirot sipped the champagne. You seem very gay, mon cher. Gay? I'm steeped in misery, wallowing in gloom. Tell me, you hear this tune they're playing? You recognize it? Poirot hazarded cautiously. Something perhaps to do with your baby having left you? Not a bad guess, said the young man, but wrong for once. There's nothing like love for making you miserable. That's what it's called. Aha! My favorite tune, said Tony Chapel mournfully. And my favorite restaurant, my favorite band, and my favorite girl's here, and she's dancing it with somebody else. Hence the melancholy, said Poirot. 
Exactly. Pauline and I, you see, have had what the vulgar call words. That is to say, she's had ninety-five words to five of mine out of every hundred. My five are... But, darling, I can explain. Then she starts in on her ninety-five again, and we get no further. I think, said Tony sadly, that I shall poison myself. Pauline? murmured Poirot. Pauline Weatherby, Barton Russell's young sister-in-law. Young, lovely, disgustingly rich. Tonight Barton Russell gives a party. You know him? Big business. Clean-shaven American, full of pep and personality. His wife was Pauline's sister. And who else is there at this party? Oh, you'll meet them in a minute, when the music stops. There's Lola Valdez, you know, the South American dancer in the new show at the Metropole. And there's Stephen Carter. Do you know Carter? He's in the diplomatic service, very hush-hush, known as Silent Stephen, sort of man who says, I'm not at liberty to state, etc., etc. Oh, hello. Here they come. Poirot rose. He was introduced to Barton Russell, to Stephen Carter, to Signora Lola Valdez, a dark and luscious creature, and to Pauline Weatherby, very young, very fair, with eyes like cornflowers. Barton Russell said, What? Is this the great Monsieur Hercule Poirot? I am indeed pleased to meet you, sir. Won't you sit down and join us? Uh, that is, unless... Uh, Tony Chapel broke in. He's got an appointment with a body, I believe. Or is it an absconding financier? Or the Raja of Borio Bulaga's great ruby? My friend, do you think I am never off duty? Can I not for once seek only to amuse myself? Perhaps you've got an appointment with Carter here? The latest from the UN international situation now acute. The stolen plans must be found, or war will be declared tomorrow. Pauline Weatherby said cuttingly, Must you be so completely idiotic, Tony? Sorry, Pauline. Tony Chapel relapsed into crestfallen silence. How severe you are, mademoiselle. I hate people who play the fool all the time. I must be careful, I see. I must converse only of serious matters. Oh, no, Monsieur Poirot, I didn't mean you. She turned a smiling face to him and said, Are you really a kind of Sherlock Holmes and do wonderful deductions? Ah, the deductions. They are not so easy in real life. But uh, shall I try? Now then, I deduce that yellow irises are your favorite flowers. Quite wrong, Monsieur Poirot. Lilies of the valley, or roses. Poirot sighed. A failure. I will try once more. Uh, this evening, not very long ago, you telephoned to someone. Pauline laughed and clapped her hands. Oh, quite right. It was not long after you arrived here. Right again. I telephoned the minute I got inside the doors. Ah, that is not so good. You telephoned before you came to this table. Yes. Decidedly very bad. Oh, no, I think it was very clever of you. How did you know I had telephoned? That, mademoiselle, is the great detective's secret. And the person to whom you telephoned, does the name begin with a P, perhaps? Or with an H? Pauline laughed. Quite wrong. I telephoned to my maid to post some frightfully important letters that I'd never sent off. Her name's Louise. I am confused. Quite confused. The music began again. What about it, Pauline? asked Tony. I don't think I want to dance again so soon, Tony. Oh, isn't that too bad? said Tony bitterly to the world at large. Poirot murmured to the South American girl on his other side. Signora, I would not dare to ask you to dance with me. I am too much of the antique. Lola Valdez said, Ah, it is nonsense that you talk there. You are still young. Your hair, it is still black. Poirot winced slightly. Appalling. As your brother-in-law and your guardian, Barton Russell spoke heavily, I'm just going to force you onto the floor. This one's a waltz, and a waltz is about the only dance I really can do. Why, of course, Barton. We'll take the floor right away. Good girl, Pauline. That's swell of you. They went off together. Tony tipped back his chair. Then he looked at Stephen Carter. Talkative little fellow, aren't you, Carter? he remarked. 
Help to make a party go with your merry chatter, eh, what? Really, Chapel, I don't know what you mean. Oh, you don't, don't you? Tony mimicked him. My dear fellow. Drink, drink, man, if you won't talk. No, thanks. Then I will. Stephen Carter shrugged his shoulders. Excuse me, must just speak to a fellow I know over there. Fellow I was with at Eton. Stephen Carter got up and walked to a table a few places away. Tony said gloomily, Somebody ought to drown old Etonians at birth. Hercule Poirot was still being gallant to the dark beauty beside him. He murmured, I wonder. May I ask, what are the favourite flowers of Mademoiselle? Ah, now, why is it you want to know? Lola was arch. Mademoiselle, if I send flowers to a lady, I am particular that they should be flowers she likes. Oh, that is very charming of you, Monsieur Poirot. I will tell you. I adore the big, dark red carnations, or the dark red roses. Superb. Yes, superb. You do not then like uh, yellow irises? Yellow flowers, no. They do not accord with my temperament. How wise. Tell me, mademoiselle, did you ring up a friend tonight since you arrived here? I? Ring up a friend? No. What a curious question. Ah, but I am a, <laughs> a very curious man. I'm sure you are. She rolled her dark eyes at him. A very dangerous man. Oh, no, no. Not dangerous. Say, uh, a man who may be useful in danger. You understand? Lola giggled. She showed even white teeth. No, no, she laughed. You are dangerous. Hercule Poirot sighed. I see that you do not understand. <laughs> All this is very strange. Tony came out of a fit of abstraction and said suddenly, Lola, what about a spot of swoop and dip? Come along. I will come, yes, since Monsieur Poirot is not brave enough. Tony put an arm round her and remarked over his shoulder to Poirot as they glided off, You can meditate on crime yet to come, old boy. Poirot said, It is profound what you say there. Yes, it is profound. He sat meditatively for a minute or two, then he raised a finger. Luigi came promptly, his wide Italian face wreathed in smiles. Mon vieux, said Poirot, I need some information. Always at your service, monsieur. I desire to know how many of these people at the table here have used the telephone tonight. I can tell you, monsieur. The young lady, the one in white, she telephoned at once when she got here. Then she went to leave her cloak, and while she was doing that, the other lady came out of the cloakroom and went into the telephone box. So, the signora did telephone. Was that before she came into the restaurant? Yes, monsieur. Anyone else? No, monsieur. All of this, Luigi, gives me furiously to think. Indeed, monsieur? Yes, I think, Luigi, that tonight of all nights I must have my wits about me. Something is going to happen, Luigi. And I am not at all sure what it is. Anything I can do, monsieur. Poirot made a sign. Luigi slipped discreetly away. Stephen Carter was returning to the table. We are still deserted, Mr. Carter, said Poirot. Oh, uh, 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 quite, said the other. You know Mr. Barton Russell well? Yes, known him a good while. His sister-in-law, little Miss Weatherby, is very charming. Yes, pretty girl. You know her well, too? White. Oh, white, white, said Poirot. Carter stared at him. The music stopped, and the others returned. Barton Russell said to a waiter, Another bottle of champagne, quickly. Then he raised his glass. See here, folks. I'm going to ask you to drink a toast. To tell you the truth, there's an idea back of this little party tonight. As you know... I've ordered a table for six. There were only five of us. That gave us an empty place. 
Then, by a very strange coincidence, Monsieur Hercule Poirot happened to pass by, and I asked him to join our party. You don't know yet what an apt coincidence that was. You see, that empty seat tonight represents a lady, the lady in whose memory this party is being given. This party, ladies and gentlemen, is being held in memory of my dear wife, Iris, who died exactly four years ago on this very date. There was a startled movement round the table. Barton Russell, his face quietly impassive, raised his glass. I'll ask you to drink to her memory. Iris. Iris? said Poirot sharply. He looked at the flowers. Barton Russell caught his glance and gently nodded his head. There were little murmurs round the table. Iris. Iris. Everyone looked startled and uncomfortable. Barton Russell went on, speaking with his slow, monotonous American intonation, each word coming out weightily. It may seem odd to you all that I should celebrate the anniversary of a death in this way, by a supper party in a fashionable restaurant. But I have reason. Yes, I have a reason. For Monsieur Poirot's benefit, I'll explain. He turned his head towards Poirot. Four years ago tonight, Monsieur Poirot, there was a supper party held in New York. At it were my wife and myself, Mr. Stephen Carter, who was attached to the embassy in Washington, Mr. Anthony Chapel, who had been a guest in our house for some weeks, and Signora Valdez, who was at that time enchanting New York City with her dancing. Little Pauline here, he patted her shoulder, was only sixteen, but she came to the supper party as a special treat. You remember, Pauline? I, I remember, yes. Her voice shook a little. Monsieur Poirot. On that night a tragedy happened. There was a roll of drums, and the cabaret started. The lights went down, all but a spotlight in the middle of the floor. When the lights went up again, Monsieur Poirot, my wife was seen to have fallen forward on the table. She was dead. Stone dead. There was potassium cyanide found in the dregs of her wine glass, and the remains of the packet was discovered in her handbag. She had committed suicide? said Poirot. That was the accepted verdict. It broke me up, Monsieur Poirot. There was, perhaps, a possible reason for such an action. The police thought so. I accepted their decision. He pounded suddenly on the table. But I was not satisfied. No. For four years I've been thinking and brooding, and I'm not satisfied. I don't believe Iris killed herself. I believe, Monsieur Poirot, that she was murdered. By one of those people at the table. Look here, sir. Tony Chapel half sprung to his feet. Be quiet, Tony, said Russell. I haven't finished. One of them did it. I'm sure of that now. Someone who, under cover of the darkness, slipped the half-emptied packet of cyanide into her handbag. I think I know which of them it was. I mean to know the truth. Lola's voice rose sharply. You are mad, crazy. Who would have harmed her? No, you are mad. Me, I will not stay. She broke off. There was a roll of drums. Barton Russell said, The cabaret. Afterwards, we will go on with this. Stay where you are, all of you. I've got to go and speak to the dance band. Little arrangement I've made with them. He got up and left the table. Extraordinary business, commented Carter. The man's mad. He is crazy, yes, said Lola. The lights were lowered. For two pins I'd clear out, said Tony. No, Pauline spoke sharply. Then she murmured, Oh dear, oh dear, what is it, mademoiselle? murmured Poirot. She answered, almost in a whisper, It's horrible. It's just like it was that night. Shh, shh, said several people. Poirot lowered his voice. A little word in your ear, he whispered, then patted her shoulder. All will be well, he assured her. My God, listen, cried Lola. What is it, Signora? It is the same tune, the same song that they played that night in New York. Barton Russell must have fixed it. I, I, I don't like this. 
Courage, courage. Then there was a fresh hush. A girl walked out into the middle of the floor, a coal-black girl with rolling eyeballs and white glistening teeth. She began to sing in a deep, hoarse voice, a voice that was curiously moving. I've forgotten you. I never think of you. The way you walked, the way you talked, the things you used to say. I've forgotten you. I never think of you. I couldn't say for sure today whether your eyes were blue or grey. I've forgotten you. I never think of you. I'm through thinking of you. I tell you I'm through thinking of you. 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 The sobbing tune. The deep golden negro voice had a powerful effect. It hypnotized, cast a spell. Even the waiters felt it. The whole room stared at her, hypnotized by the thick, cloying emotion she distilled. A waiter passed softly round the table, filling up glasses, murmuring, Champagne, in an undertone, but all attention was on the one glowing spot of light, the black woman whose ancestors came from Africa, singing in her deep voice, I've forgotten you, I never think of you. Oh, what a lie! I shall think of you, think of you, think of you, till I die. The applause broke out frenziedly. The lights went up. Barton Russell came back and slipped into his seat. She's great, that girl, cried Tony. But his words were cut short by a low cry from Lola. Look! Look! And then they all saw. Pauline Weatherby dropped forward onto the table. Lola cried, She's dead! Just like Iris! Like Iris in New York! Poirot sprang from his seat, signing to the others to keep back. He bent over the huddled form very gently, lifted a limp hand, and felt for a pulse. His face was white and stern. The others watched him. They were paralyzed, held in a trance. Slowly Poirot nodded his head. Yes, she is dead. La pauvre petite. And I, sitting by her, ah, but this time the murderer shall not escape. Barton Russell. His face grey muttered, Just like Iris. She saw something. Pauline saw something that night. Only she wasn't sure. She told me she wasn't sure. We must get the police. Oh, God. Little Pauline. Poirot said, Where is her glass? He raised it to his nose. Yes. I can smell the cyanide. A smell of bitter almonds. The same method, the same poison. He picked up her handbag. Let us look in her handbag. Barton Russell cried out. You don't believe this is suicide, too? <laughs> Not on your life. Wait, Poirot commanded. No, there is nothing here. The lights went up, you see, too quickly. The murderer had not time. Therefore the poison is still on him. Or her, said Carter. He was looking at Lola Valdez. She spat out, What do you mean? What do you say? That I killed her? It is not true, not true. Why should I do such a thing? You had a fancy for Barton Russell yourself in New York. That's the gossip I heard. Argentine beauties are notoriously jealous. That is a pack of lies. And I do not come from the Argentine. I come from Peru. Ah, I spit on you. I— She lapsed into Spanish. I demand silence, cried Poirot. It is for me to speak. Barton Russell said heavily, Everyone must be searched. Poirot said calmly, No, no, it is not necessary. What do you mean, not necessary? I, Hercule Poirot, know. I see with the eyes of the mind, and I will speak. Monsieur Carter, will you show us the packet in your breast pocket? There's nothing in my pocket. What the hell? Tony, my friend, if you will be so obliging. Carter cried out, Damn you! Tony flipped the packet neatly out before Carter could defend himself. There you are, Monsieur Poirot, just as you said. It's a damned lie, cried Carter. Poirot picked up the packet, read the label. Cyanide potassium. The case is complete. Barton Russell's voice came thickly. Carter, I always thought so. Iris was in love with you. 
She wanted to go away with you. You didn't want a scandal for the sake of your precious career, so you poisoned her. You'll hang for this, your dirty dog. Silence! Poirot's voice rang out, firm and authoritative. This is not finished yet. I, Hercule Poirot, have something to say. My friend here, Tony Chappell, he says to me when I arrive that I have come in search of crime. That is partly true. There was crime in my mind. But it was to prevent a crime that I came, and I have prevented it. The murderer? He planned well. But Hercule Poirot, he was one move ahead. He had to think fast, and to whisper quickly in Mademoiselle's ear when the lights went down. She is very quick and clever, Mademoiselle Pauline. She played her part well. Mademoiselle, will you be so kind as to show us that you are not dead, after all? Pauline sat up. She gave an unsteady laugh. <laughs> Resurrection of Pauline, she said. Pauline, darling, Tony, my sweet angel. Barton Russell gasped. I, I don't understand. I will help you to understand, Mr. Barton Russell. Your plan has miscarried. My plan? Yes. Your plan. Who was the only man who had an alibi during the darkness? The man who left the table? You, Mr. Barton Russell. But you returned to it, under cover of the darkness, circling round it with a champagne bottle, filling up glasses, putting cyanide in Pauline's glass, and dropping the half-empty packet in Carter's pocket as you bent over him to remove a glass. Oh, yes. It is easy to play the part of a waiter in darkness when the attention of everyone is elsewhere. That was the real reason for your party tonight. The safest place to commit a murder is in the middle of a crowd. What the— Why the hell should I want to kill Pauline? It might be, perhaps, a question of money. Your wife left you guardian to her sister. You mentioned that fact tonight. Pauline is twenty. At twenty-one, or on her marriage— you would have to render an account of your stewardship. I suggest that you could not do that. You have speculated with it. I do not know, Mr. Barton Russell, whether you killed your wife in the same way, or whether her suicide suggested the idea of this crime to you. But I do know that tonight you have been guilty of attempted murder. It rests with Miss Pauline whether you are prosecuted for that. No, said Pauline. He can get out of my sight and out of this country— I don't want a scandal. You had better go quickly, Mr. Barton Russell, and I advise you to be very careful in future. Barton Russell got up, his face working. To hell with you, you interfering little Belgian jack and apes! He strode out angrily. Pauline sighed. Monsieur Poirot, you've been wonderful. You, mademoiselle, you have been the marvellous one to pour away the champagne, to act the dead body so prettily. <clears throat> she shivered. You give me the creeps. He said gently, It was you who telephoned me, was it not? Yes. Why? I don't know. I was worried and frightened without knowing quite why I was frightened. Barton told me he was having this party to commemorate Iris's death. I realized that he had some scheme on, but he wouldn't tell me what it was. He looked so, so queer and so excited that I felt something terrible might happen. Only, of course, I never dreamed that he meant to, to get rid of me. And so, mademoiselle? I'd heard people talking about you. I thought if I could only get you here, perhaps it would stop anything happening. I thought that being a, a foreigner... If I rang up and pretended to be in danger and, and made it sound mysterious, you thought the melodrama it would attract me. That is what puzzled me. The message itself. Definitely it was what you call bogus. It did not ring true, but the fear in the voice, that was real. Then I came, and you denied very categorically having sent me a message. Well, I had to. Besides, I didn't want you to know it was me. Ah, oh, but... Uh, I was fairly sure of that. Not at first, but I soon realized that the only two people who could know about the yellow irises on the table were you 
Or Mr. Barton Russell? Pauline nodded. I heard him ordering them to be put on the table, she explained. That and his ordering a table for six, when I knew only five were coming, made me suspect. She stopped, biting her lip. What did you suspect, mademoiselle? She said slowly, I was afraid of something happening to Mr. Carter. Stephen Carter cleared his throat. Unhurriedly, but quite decisively, he rose from the table. Uh, <clears throat> I have to uh, thank you, Mr. Poirot. I owe you a great deal. You'll excuse me, I'm sure, if I leave you. Tonight's happenings have been uh, rather upsetting. Looking after his retreating figure, Pauline said violently, I hate him. I've always thought it was because of him that Iris killed herself. Or perhaps Barton killed her. Oh, it's all so hateful. Poirot said gently, Forget, mademoiselle, forget. Let the past go. Think only of the present. Pauline murmured, Yes, you're right. Poirot turned to Lola Valdez. Signora, as the evening advances, I become more brave. If you would dance with me now. Oh, yes, indeed. You are, you are the cat's whiskers, Monsieur Poirot. I insist on dancing with you. You are too kind, Signora. Tony and Pauline were left. They leant towards each other across the table. Darling Pauline. Oh, Tony, I've been such a nasty, spiteful, spit-firing little cat to you all day. Can you ever forgive me? Angel, this is our tune again. Let's dance. They danced off, smiling at each other and humming softly. There's nothing like love for making you miserable. There's nothing like love for making you blue. Depressed, possessed, sentimental, temperamental. There's nothing like love for getting you down. There's nothing like love for driving you crazy. There's nothing like love for making you mad, abusive, elusive, suicidal, homicidal. There's nothing like love. There's nothing like love. We hope you've enjoyed Yellow Iris by Agatha Christie, performed by Hugh Fraser.